Coming up on Lawmakers, officials announce a cutoff date for enrollment in the Peach Care program. A Senate committee considers legislation that would take an inmate's immigration status into account when considering parole. And a proposal for more parental control over social networking sites like MySpace gets a hearing. Those stories and more are coming up next. This is Lawmakers, your source for all the news from under the Gold Dome. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelsky. Good evening. Also on Lawmakers, Senator Seth Harp introduces new legislation dealing with Sunday sales of alcohol. And the Public Defender Standards Council comes under fire for underestimating its budget. But our lead story tonight, the Department of Community Health has announced a March cutoff date for the peach care enrollment. As of March 11th, the Peach Care for Kids insurance program will no longer accept new enrollees. This from the Department of Community Health today as a means to maintain coverage through October for the 270,000 children who are currently on the rolls. This afternoon, a consortium of child advocates reacted to the news. When budgets are tight in a family, you don't look at your middle child and say, well, I guess you don't get health care this week. Uh, budgets are tight in our Georgia family. But it, we shouldn't take it out on our children. There are plenty of areas that we can look to to get us through this shortfall. According to Families First, the state has several options for closing the funding shortfall, even if Congress is slow to reauthorize the S-CHIP program. There's a way to fix this without doing any harm to children and families. I've been down here many years, and I've seen governors and the Georgia General Assembly fix bigger problems than this when they put their minds to it. And I don't think there's anything more important than the health of our children. In the 2007 amended budget, uh, there are about $70 million uh, that are set aside actually to pre-fund uh, Medicaid benefits in 2008. Uh, you know, it's there. Uh, that, can be, that can be allocated for this purpose. In addition, uh, what's received a lot less uh, attention is the fact that the state has the ability to leverage federal Medicaid matching dollars to solve this problem. And Linda Lowe from Families First acknowledges that the option she just mentioned would require the General Assembly to change the income cap for Medicaid. Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle has appointed four senators to work with the Department of Community Health to develop peach care funding recommendations. Senator Greg Goggins, Mitch Sebaugh, Horacina Tate, and Tommy Williams will submit the recommendations of the peach care task force in two weeks. The Democratic leadership held a press conference yesterday to reaffirm their position on the funding shortfall for peach care. House Democratic Caucus Chairman Calvin Smyrie traveled to Washington recently to urge Congress to fund this $131 million shortfall and added that the Georgia legislature must be prepared in case the money doesn't arrive in time. In talking with a couple of congressional people today, uh, their, their, the inclination and the, the feeling that I received from them was that uh, the funding possibly would be coming, but it would not possibly be here to meet our timetable, which means, therefore, while we're in legislative session, uh, there's a possibility that we as the legislative leaders uh, and members of the House and Senate and the General Assembly will have to come forward with some sort of plan to plug this hole as it relates to not only supplemental uh, 08, but how we will fix, uh, how that we will fund this as, as, as time goes on. So regardless of what the situation is, the short fix now is to try to get the funds released from Congress to fill this budget hole and, and, and then it, it, thereafter try to come with some recommendations to tweak the program and move forward and, and have funding through reauthorization. Now, Governor Sonny Perdue was also in Washington last week. He testified in the Senate Finance Committee representing Georgia and 15 other states and two territories who are facing shortfalls in their children's health insurance programs. Senator John Douglas says he wants to prevent Georgia municipalities from becoming havens for the undocumented immigrants of the state. His Senate Bill 23 would not permit local governments to set up ordinances where their courts uh, could not consider legal residency when setting bail. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman has more. Jesse. The Senate Judiciary Committee passed in Bill 23 by an overwhelming majority this afternoon. Senator John Douglas says it will force undocumented persons who are charged with crimes to remain in the country. If someone commits a crime in Georgia and happens to be here illegally, uh, the interest of the people of this state and the interest of, the, of, of all of us is that they pay for their crime. 
and if they are a flight risk because of their immigration status, then the court could take that, and the parole board could take that into consideration. Senator Vincent Ford cast the only dissenting vote when the bill passed today. He questioned Douglas before the vote was taken, asking, don't judges already have the option of considering a defendant's residence status? Yes, and, and, as we, and as we said a few minutes ago, Senator, before you arrived, this would... This is basically looking ahead to if one of if a city or more than one city in Georgia declared itself a sanctuary city for illegal immigrants, as a number of major metropolitan areas have, then this would allow their courts and their judges to continue to consider immigration status even after that de declaration was made. The bill would also guarantee the State Board of Pardons and Paroles the option of considering residency before making a parole ruling. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Now, Jesse, Senator Douglas mentioned that some cities around the country do restrict judges from considering residency. Did he mention which cities those were? Well, in Wanda, yes, he did. He mentioned New York, L.A., Boston, and San Francisco. Thank you. The sponsor of a bill to allow local referendums on beer and wine sales on Sunday will file two more bills that he hopes will address concerns over his original legislation. Senator Seth Harp is gathering signatures for his bills that would also include the sale of liquor on Sundays and prohibit sales until afternoon on Sundays. What we've tried to do is address the objections that we've heard from uh, the various factions that people have had, had concerns in terms of the le legislation. And we've tried to address that. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the people of Georgia want to have the opportunity to vote on an issue that will allow them to have uh, the, to purchase alcohol products on Sunday. And what these two bills do is they, they essentially take that preposition and then what they do is they add the idea that uh, sales would not be allowed until after 12 o'clock on Sunday. And second of all, uh, the second thing is, is they have an opportunity to add distilled spirits. This is definitely an effort to try to reach out to the religious community and say we respect what's, what you are. I'm a part of that. I consider myself a part of it. And, and frankly, the idea is to try to consider that with the, with the various people. Now that Senator Harp has three bills on the issue, he is hoping Senator David Schaefer, chair of the Regulated Industries and Utilities Committee, will hold a hearing on them or all of them. A bill that would require parental permission for children to open accounts on MySpace or other social networking sites got its first public hearing this afternoon. Lawmaker Sandra Paris joins us from the Capitol with more. Sandra. In Wandi, members of both the House and Senate Science and Technology Committees heard from law enforcement as well as computer experts on Senate Bill 59. While all agree child predators on the Internet are a problem, their own solutions varied. If you are trying to follow the trends and do legislation concerning trends that because they're so fluid that's like trying to hold water in your hand or nail jello to the wall. Instead I would propose that you consider looking at what you can do for the user and the abuser because those are the ones that will go from trend to trend to trend and whatever you do would be would stick and would be consistent. In other words, I can tell you for sure if a child is unaware of what they're doing that's risky and they're doing risky things on MySpace, when they leave this and go to the next trend, they're going to continue those risky behaviors. We believe that there is no single solution for best protecting children online. Rather, online safety requires a multifaceted approach involving ever-evolving technology, public education, partner and partnerships with law enforcement and other groups to keep the Internet safe for our children. My fear is that actually legislation to to protect the users is actually potentially going to do the opposite for them. Is that uh, giving parents some sort of, uh, I guess, a false sense of security would, would be my concern. Is that as, as a computer programmer, it's extremely difficult. It's very challenging. We can touch on that in, in a moment. It'd be very challenging to address how to uh, identify the parent, much less the child. Now, Senator Cecil Staten, chair of the Senate Science and Technology Committee and sponsor of the bill, says his committee will hold another hearing on the measure before taking a vote. Reporting live, I'm Sandra Parrish for Lawmakers.
Thank you, Sandra. The Georgia Public Defender Standards Council is also facing a funding shortfall. They requested $27 million last year in the 2007 budget. However, that was only enough to fund them for nine months of the fiscal year. Council President Michael Mears testified before a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee yesterday where Chairman Preston Smith was critical of his fiscal management. We have to make tough decisions about whether to fund health care for children under peach care. When you're asking for a supplemental appropriation of $10 million to provide attorneys to criminals and those that have been accused of crimes, uh, when you have not even budgeted to get to the amended budget. And the precedent that sets for other departments, if another department had came in here and sat down and said, I realize that we took a, an appropriation for fiscal year 07, but we, we are going to be out of money in February or March because we've, that's all there is. They would lose their job. They would not be able to continue operating under the state if they did that. And, and what you're telling us is, we're going to shut down public defense in Georgia if you do not give us the money we want. And forget about peach care and every other need we have to balance because yours is the only one that matters. Senator Smith, I do know that there was instances where the General Assembly has appropriated money because of, of glitches in the budget and there was a lack of funds but for a lot of different reasons. Senator Smith, I wish I could go back and find a different way to have addressed this issue. It may well cost me my job. If that happens, so be it. I've offered to resign if my actions in any way have affected the continuation of what I think is the best public defender system in the United States. We're now being used as a model. Now, I know this is not a reason for you to fund us or not fund us. But the model that we have put together, the 761 people that we have in place providing services, are a model for other states who do not have statewide public defender systems. I wish I could have go back and figure out how not to have relied upon what I did. I did. I take full responsibility for that. And what we're asking now, asking for help to get us through until the legislature makes a decision on the supplemental budget request so that we don't have to stop. The subcommittee heard the rest of the council's budget situation but made no decision on the funding shortfall. Senator Renee Unterman took the well today to explain Senate Bill 57, which requires dialysis technicians to be certified by the Georgia Board of Nursing. Senator Jeff Mullis followed with a personal story about why he believes this bill is necessary. What this bill does is um, license renal dialysis technicians. You've heard myself and the senator from the 54th talk numerous times about renal disease, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease and the prevalence of it in the state of Georgia. In 2003, my father passed away, and he became ill the winter before with... Um, uh, renal failure, but he died not because of renal failure, and he he passed away not because of dialysis or diabetes, but he passed away because of staph infection caused by the process. And who knows? Maybe if there were some guidelines or requirements for training for dialysis workers, that wouldn't have happened. Senate Bill 57, which is known as the Ray Biddy and Jean Mullis Act, named after Senator Mullis' father, passed unanimously and now heads to the House. The House today decided to exempt some VIPs from misdemeanor charges for tinted windows. Representative Ron Forster explains House Bill 79. Legislation was initially intended to protect officers from uh, occasions where an offender would be in wait, I guess, behind the dark tent. And what this bill simply does is say those vehicles that have a foreign ambassador, uh, state and local, federal, or, uh, pri or licensed private investigator uh, are, exempt from, are exempt from the misdemeanor. House bill, House bill 79 passed 142 to 13. The House also adopted changes to commercial fishing. House bill 100 passed 156 to 10. And the House finally agreed that uh, they should require that all ingredients be listed on the labels for horse feed. House bill 122 passed 162 to 0. HB 122, 179 all moved to the Senate. 
Senator Vincent Fort took a point of personal privilege this morning to express his disapproval of the payday lending bill, which is currently in the House. Fort believes House Bill 163 strips consumer protections. He added that a man who visited the Capitol uh, last week named Niger Ennis with the Congress of Racial Equality probably should have registered as a lobbyist. I don't think he came down here from New York City on his own dime. You know, and I am reluctant to call anyone an outside agitator. Uh, but we don't need Mr. Ennis to come down here and tell us our business about payday loans or anything. I hope he doesn't come back, but if he comes back, we're going to sit with him and meet with him and try to educate him on how to protect consumers here in Georgia. But we don't need him, don't want to see him, and hope he stays where he is and let us do our business without, and if he does come back, at least he ought to have a lobbyist badge and he ought to be able to tell us who is paying him. But more importantly, I wanted to commend both the insurance commissioner and the attorney general for standing strong for the consumers of the state of Georgia. In other news, the University of Georgia's scientists say the state of Georgia is leading the way in stem cell research. Dr. Steve Stice, director of Regenerative Bioscience Center, gave a presentation today to the Joint House and Senate Health and Human Services Committees to highlight the future benefits of continual stem cell research. To answer ethical opposition, Dr. Stice explains that the embryos used are those that would otherwise be discarded daily from fertility clinics. Dr. Stice spoke to legislators about the importance of this research. Today we'd like to give the uh, senators and representatives some more information about stem cells, what they can do, and how we've been working with Senator Isaacson at the national level to provide new legislation for stem cell research. This is a dish of embryonic stem cells where a group of these cells came together and said to each other, "Hey." Let's turn into a uh, cardiac uh, muscle cell. That's basically how we can uh, uh, really describe it today. Uh, there's no other cell, there's no neural cells in there. It's, uh, again, this is a microscopic picture about the size of a tip of a pin. But no other stem cells can do this. You cannot turn any other stem cell into a beating cell in a Petri dish. It just shows you, again, the potential of these cells. Wouldn't it be great, instead of having to do whole heart uh, transplants, to just be able to take out the diseased or dead tissue in the heart and be able to replace it with something like this? Today's session was strictly educational. Currently, there is no pending legislation regarding stem cell research before the General Assembly. Representative Bob Holmes wants federal election reform, and he wants it to start at the state level. He says he will introduce a bill that will initiate an interstate agreement changing the way Electoral College casts its votes. This method of voting does not reflect the one-person, one-vote principle of vote equality, because each small state, and there are about 13 of them, is given a minimum of three Electoral College votes regardless of their population. So what this means, for example, is that the votes in one state count more than they do in others because of the structure of the Electoral College. For example, uh, Wyoming has about 600,000 citizens. About 200,000 citizens in Wyoming can have one elector, whereas a few, whereas Georgia, it takes approximately 700,000 people to elect one member of the Electoral College from their state. In the case of California, it takes 1.2 million people to, in fact, elect one elector. Now, Representative Holmes says the system of casting all of a state's electoral college votes for the presidential candidate who wins a majority in the state is archaic. He says the 2000 election is a prime example of this. It was really the beginning was in 2000 with the Gore election when the candidate received the fewest uh, received fewer votes, actually won the presidency, and then the situation in 2004 with a change in one state could in fact have done the same. Representative Holmes has not yet filed his legislation. He says he has one re Republican committed to co-signing it and will probably file a bill Monday.
It's PTA Day at the Capitol today, and the Georgia PTA wants to make sure that legislators understand the impact of almost $140 million in austerity cuts proposed in the FY 2008 budget. Anytime there's a reduction in state funding, it impacts the local level significantly, and particularly those school systems who do not have a tax base in which to continue to support uh, and deliver a quality education to a growing population of students. The Georgia PTA is lobbying legislators to allow that lottery funds be used to purchase school technology in opposition to the governor's proposed Hope Chest Amendment. The group also opposes using public money to fund faith-based services, charter school systems, and vouchers to attend private schools for special needs students. SB10 is a voucher system and as an organization who is strongly opposed to vouchers we would not support SB10. If a parent chooses to take their child from the public school system to the private, inst or private school, the concern would be the rights of those students. State and federal governments make mandates and place re restrictions on public schools so if they really feel that less restrictions are better, then why do we have to go to a charter system? The group also opposes tax-cutting measures like a proposal by House Speaker Pro Tem Mark Burkhalter to eliminate automobile ad valorem tax. The ad valorem tax, which goes directly to our school system, results in hundreds of thousands of dollars, once again impacting the instruction and delivery of instruction in classrooms. And to put it in terms that people will understand, it would, for some school systems, it would mean less teachers in their schools. So that's a direct implication of obviously yes you'd like to pay less for your car tax but let's look at how you replace those tax dollars before you put that into into law the georgia pta also opposes senate resolution 20 which would limit budgetary spending to population growth plus inf inflation outstanding high school and college athletes were honored at the capitol this morning a resolution recognizing today as girls and women in sports day was introduced in the house and senate lawmakers lanny walker has more National Women's Sports Day was yesterday, and last night, a banquet sponsored by WIN, Women Athletes in Georgia, was held to honor local female athletes. Awards were given to those who have excelled in their chosen sport. Representative Stephanie Benfield acknowledged some of those young women today in the House. I do want to honor, we have waiting patiently up in the balcony, some outstanding Georgia female athletes who have been honored statewide for their achievements. Juliana McConnell, Vice Chair of Georgia Commission on Women, spoke on why she feels it is important to have a day to commend women in sports. Well, each year we want to uh, recognize women in sports and to encourage uh, more young women to, uh, to become involved in sports, uh, at, as I said, in both high school and college and at the professional level. For many of the young women who are honored today, playing sports is an important part of their lives. I spoke with one young woman about what she had gained from her athletic experiences. For women, it's just so important because, you know, people think that women shouldn't, you know, be out there and playing sports. I mean, when you get out there and you show them that you can do it, it's just a great feeling. Those that gathered here this morning say that declaring today Girl and Women's Sports Day will help bring support to women currently involved in sports and encouragement to the future female athletes of Georgia. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Lanny Walker. Georgia's court-appointed special advocates, or CASAs, convened at the Capitol today for the annual CASA and Foster Youth Day. Lawmakers Rick Wheatman has more. This Thursday, the Capitol played host to an assembly of CASA board members and staff from 47 programs existing throughout the state. The advocates attended the annual CASA and Foster Youth Day for an opportunity to meet with members of Georgia's legislature and share concerns about abused and neglected children while promoting House Bill 270. We have an annual day at the Capitol where we come and, uh, and educate and encourage uh, legislators about the importance of, of quality advocacy for children who have been abused and neglected. Uh, and we also have a House Bill 270 that clarifies the roles and responsibilities of, of CASA volunteers and what's expected of them and what the limitations are for them. CASA volunteers' goal is to advocate for a safe permanent home for abused or neglected children while gathering information about the child's situation, attending court proceedings, and making judicial recommendations. Last year, almost 2,000 CASA volunteers served over 8,000 children. CASA exists in 70% of Georgia's counties, but plans are in place to expand over the next few years. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Rick Wheatman. It was also Aviation Day under the Gold Dome today. Representatives from Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport held a press conference this morning to allow some good news to take flight. Lawmakers Quandra Collins has that story. 
During their fourth annual celebration, Hartsville-Jackson officials highlighted the success and potential challenges of the world's biggest airport. We opened the, the most important runway in America last year. It cost us $1.2 billion, and we returned $100 million to our treasury. So it was on time and under budget. But DaCosta stresses more federal funding is needed to accommodate the growing demands of airport improvement programs. Currently, these programs have a $2.75 billion budget, which is a 30% decrease from last year's budget of $3.55 billion. Traffic in America is back. We've got to keep up our investment to continue our growth for the future. DaCosta also mentions that a $3 increase to the passenger facility charge is crucial to help cover the construction costs of future expansion projects. We hope that it will be $7.50 because that's what we think airports on a nationwide basis and here at Hartsville-Jackson in Atlanta need for us to be successful. Although Hartsville-Jackson Atlanta International Airport is faced with many challenges, airport officials say that plans to construct an international terminal will help increase traffic around the world. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Quandra Collins. The General Assembly definitely had Georgia on its mind today, thanks to a performance in the House by legendary pianist and songwriter Chuck Lavelle, who also had the state's Timberland on his mind. And as we all know, uh, there are some wonderful new opportunities uh, for us in, in the near future for our forest. The prospect of ethanol from our young pines is very, very exciting, and it's just one of the great opportunities that we have. And I know that Georgia is going to continue to lead the way. Oh. Sometimes they reach out, another smile. I'm also very excited about our conservation initiatives. Governor, Governor Perdue's call for $50 million for the Georgia Land Conservation Program is something that I believe should be supported, and I urge all of you to support that initiative. Oh, no peace. I'm Thank you. Thank you all so much. Coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, we'll have an exclusive interview with Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle about his first month in office. The governor's hope chess legislation is expected to be considered in Senate committee, and it's Epilepsy Awareness Day at the Capitol. We'll have those stories and all the latest from Under the Gold Dome tomorrow night at 7 p.m. This Saturday, February 10th, join Lawmakers for a special broadcast during Family Day 2007 at the state capitol. We'll be broadcasting live from 10 a.m. till noon. That's a Lawmakers special Family Day 2007. 2007, this Saturday, February 10th from 10 a.m. till noon. If you have missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, tune in tomorrow morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. Now stay tuned for No Holes Barred. Tonight's episode features immigration reform. That program is coming up next here on GPB. And that's our broadcast for this, the 15th legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Edwandi Lawson. And I'm David Zelsky. Thanks for joining us. We'll leave you now with a little more of that performance from Chuck Lavelle. Have a great evening. Good night. It comes as sweet and clear.